grace and peace. X3. One more time. X chapter 3. This is New Testament video 337, X lesson 13. X 3. Heavenly Father, may we receive with open hearts and believe in our hearts the words that we will now study in your book. Thank you as you impart spiritual wisdom, spiritual knowledge, and spiritual understanding to us as the Holy Spirit teaches. In Christ's name, thank you. Amen. X3. X3. I will read the entire chapter. X3. Verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, verse 12, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk. The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murderer to be granted unto you, and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all, and now, brethren, I wot that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. Verse 19. 
our precept study. Repent ye, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. So we teach the rest of Acts 3. Peter and John review the last two studies are walking to the Jerusalem temple. It's the hour of prayer. It's the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon. There's a certain man lame from birth, from his mother's womb. He's laid daily at the gate of the temple on the eastern side. It's called the beautiful gate. Toward the Mount of Olives on the east. This lame man from birth is carried every day and set at that gate so he can beg for alms as the passers-by enter and exit the temple. What a pitiful existence. He notices Peter and John soon to enter the temple. Hey, do you have anything you can give me? Peter, he fastens his eyes. He stares at the lame man. John is looking also. The apostles Peter and John, leading apostles of Israel. Peter and John say to the lame man, Look on us. And the man looks at them. He pays attention to them. He gave heed to them, verse 5, expecting to receive something of them. Oh, they have something for him. But it's not alms. Peter said, silver and gold have I none. I don't have gold or silver. Don't ask me for any money. 
but what I do have. But such as I have, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. What I do possess is some Christ-given authority over sickness, over Satan. The lame man symbolizes Israel, the nation Israel. Just outside of God's presence. Can't make it into the kingdom on his own, on her own. I'm unable. I'm not spiritually strong enough. A sin. The Adamic nature. The man has a problem. And corruptible things such as silver and gold cannot save him from his pathetic plight. Instead of seeking help from fellow people, you need to seek Almighty God to intervene and do for you what you can do for yourself and what others can do for you. Acts 3, 6. Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. In the name of Jesus Christ, not in the name of Peter, not in the name of John, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, verse 7, and lifted him up. And immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Another miracle of the kingdom, a sign of the gospel of the kingdom. Verse 8, and he leaping up stood. He's healed. Peter's first miracle, as recorded in the Bible. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, converted Israel, at Christ's return. He enters with them, with the apostles Peter and John, into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God, redeemed Israel. Sanctified Israel, forgiven Israel, and all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. Irrefutable proof. Jesus Christ is working through his apostles. No doubt, no question whatsoever. Acts 3, verse 10. They're filled with wonder and amazement. It can't be. It is. It can be and it is. It's true. Acts 3, 11. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them, in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. They're aghast, bewildered. Solomon's porch, a colonnade on the eastern side of the temple again. The beautiful gate on the eastern side, toward the Mount of Olives. 
Solomon's porch on the eastern side of the temple too. The east, the east. The Mount of Olives is to the east. That's significant. Because Christ's return, second coming, will be to the Mount of Olives. Acts 1, Zechariah 14. That is when Israel is nationally restored to God. The Shekinah glory, the presence of Almighty God that left, vacated the Jerusalem temple, Solomon's temple, almost 600 years before Christ, for his earthly ministry. That Shekinah glory, that presence of God, comes back at Christ's return. Malachi 3, 1, the Lord shall come to the temple, second coming. That matches, by the way, John 8, verse 1. And the woman taken in adultery. Oh, that's Israel too. The forgiven under the new covenant. Anyway, we cover that in John. I'll show you this. I didn't show you last lesson. I'll show you this one. Ezekiel. Ezekiel. Chapter 43, the prophet Ezekiel receives some prophetic insight. So God shows him what will occur in the future. Ezekiel looks ahead 2,600 years. Ezekiel 43, here is the Jerusalem temple restored for the millennium, for the literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Israeli kingdom. Ezekiel 43.1, afterward he brought me to the gate, even the gate that looketh toward the east, east, and behold the glory of the God of Israel came from the way of the east and his voice was like a noise of many waters and the earth shined with his glory the brightness of his coming 2 Thessalonians 2 Malachi 4 it's like Sunrise, the Mount of Transfiguration, Matthew 17, Mark 9, Luke 9, the brightness, the radiance, the blinding brilliance. Ezekiel 43, the Lord Jesus Christ has come back. Verse 3, and it was according to the appearance of the vision, which I saw even according to the vision, that I saw when I came to destroy the city. And the visions were like the vision that I saw by the river Kabor. And I fell upon my face, and the glory of the Lord came into the house by the way of the gate, whose prospect is toward the east. So the Lord took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. That's the Millennial Temple. So Acts 3. I told you already. Acts 3 is a picture of kingdom glory. Israel 
powerless, unable to walk uprightly, perverse, crooked, untoward, lame, unable to walk in righteousness, destitute of spiritual strength, health, Israel is nothing but a spiritual beggar. Acts 3. This is what sin has caused. This is what Satan's evil world system has caused. Pagan idolatry. False religion. Traditions of the rabbis. Deceived and poverty stricken. Hopeless and helpless in and of herself. But in the Messiah, in Christ, in the Son of God, there's hope, there's salvation. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And there is Israel under the new covenant, walking, doing the Lord's work in the earth. They will be my people and I will be their God. Read Ezekiel 36. They will walk in my statutes and do my judgments. Not in Acts 3. They're still in bondage to sin, Satan. But that will not be true in Christ returns. X3 is a picture of what that return of Christ will be like. X312 and when Peter saw it, they're greatly wondering, there's a crowd gathered here. He answered unto the people, X312, ye men of Israel. The miracle grabs their attention. And now he preaches. You see that, huh? Now listen to what I have to say. What the Holy Spirit has to teach you through what you see. The lame man walking and leaping and praising God. There's something to learn here. Something to believe. Someone to trust. Acts 3.12 Ye men of Israel! The world? No. Ye men of Israel! Why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? We didn't do anything ourselves. As though by our own power or holiness, as Peter and John, we had made this man to walk. It's not who we are, but whom we serve. Now look at the Jewish language, the Hebrew Bible terminology. Acts 3, 13. The God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers. That excludes Gentiles. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers. That's the Jehovah God, the Lord God of the Hebrew Scriptures. The God of the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms. I'm talking to you about that God 
Israel. The God who gave you and your forefathers covenants, messianic promises, prophecies. See the restriction to Israel? Acts 3, 13. The God of our fathers has glorified His Son, Jesus. Remember that Jesus? Whom He delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate months ago. When he, Pilate, was determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just, and desired a murder, Barabbas, to be granted unto you. And you killed the Prince of Life. Ooh. He's the author. He's the origin of life. And you sought to kill him. Take his life. And you did. Slay him. In unbelief. However, whom God hath raised from the dead, 15, whereof we are witnesses, that same Jesus you crucified and slain. God raised him from the dead. He's alive. The Jesus Christ You publicly refused. He's alive. He's resurrected. He's alive and well. He's away as a royal exile. He's at his father's right hand in the third heaven presently. But he is coming back. He will reign. You'd better get ready. That's when he comes back, he will judge his foes and make them his footstool. You, in unbelief, Israel, are his foes. So there's a call to repentance again. As in Acts 2, so in Acts 3. Acts 3.16, And his name through faith in his name hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. And now, brethren, I would that through ignorance ye did it, as did also your rulers. But those things which God before had showed by the mouth of all his prophets, that Christ should suffer, he hath so fulfilled. You meant it for evil, killing Messiah, Christ. What you did was fulfill Bible prophecy. The Holy Spirit does not charge them with murder, premeditated killing. No, they manslaughter. Unawares, ignorant, an ignorant killing. You and your rulers. Were spiritually blind. And so... According to the law of Moses, you have a chance to flee as the slayer unawares run to the city of refuge, come to the little flock, join the little flock, forsake this untoward generation, your apostate nation.
Run to the Lord Jesus Christ by faith while there's still time before the Antichrist arrives. Acts 3, verse 19. Enough review. Acts 3.19. Here's the call to repentance. Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Repentance. We covered this in Acts 2.38, didn't we? We'll do it again. Remember Luke. Remember Luke 13. Luke 13.6. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. Then said he unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree, and find none. Cut it down, why cumbereth it the ground? And he answering said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it, and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that thou shalt cut it down. That is interpreted in Isaiah 5, Matthew 21, and Mark 11. The barren fig tree. That's Israel's works religious system that has produced no spiritual fruit. There's no faith. There's no sincere seeking of the Savior. Well, these people don't think they sin. They're good enough. I've come looking for fruit on the fig tree. For three years. Mm, three years? Oh! Christ's earthly ministry. I found no fruit. What we have here are self righteous, self sufficient, so they believe. People. Give them one more year. One more year. See, remember Matthew 3? John the Baptist, verse 2, said, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In Matthew 4, Jesus preached that. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Verse 17, Israel has been unmindful of the rock that begun it. They've forgotten the one true God. Satan's policy of evil, Satan's evil world system, has distracted Israel away from God's word to her. And now... The nation Israel, by the time of Christ's earthly ministry, is doing this spiritually. Looking in all directions but the right one. Disoriented, confused, mixed up. Deceived. Not thinking properly, no renewed mind. Lunatic. 
Matthew 4, Jesus cures lunacy so as to teach. I can cure Israel's spiritual insanity. Repent! Repent. Okay. They didn't repent in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Huh. Matthew 12. Matthew 12. Matthew chapter 12, 31. Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. But the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. So Israel spoke against the Son of Man during his earthly ministry, didn't she? We have no king but Caesar was the culmination of that unbelief. John 19. You denied him in the presence of Pilate. When Pilate wanted to free him, you demanded he be put to death. Now the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, is given in early Acts. Acts 2 onward. Israel, you'd better treat the Holy Spirit with more respect than you treated me during my earthly ministry. You'll be forgiven of blaspheming against me, but you will not be forgiven if you speak against the Holy Ghost. And that's the early Acts period, isn't it? The apostles filled with the Holy Ghost, they're preaching to Israel. There's a believing remnant, approximately 3,000 saved on the day of Pentecost. But what's 3,000 in a nation of millions? A very small remnant. Acts 2, Acts 2 verse 38. After preaching Peter gives an invitation here. You killed Messiah. The God has raised him up and he's coming back. He's Lord in Christ. What shall we do? Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, Early Acts is Israel's renewed opportunity of repentance. Now, remember, what is repentance? Repentance is a change in mind. Metanoia. A change in mind. Repentance is not, ah, I'm so sorry for my sins, Lord. I'm real sorry. Bawling the eyes out. Come kneel at the altar. Come repent. Turn from your sins. All of that is. It, it is. I don't want to be mean. But you deserve my friend. To be told the truth. There's so much error. In our denominations. An understatement. Repentance is a change in mind. Israel, stop thinking foolish thoughts. For centuries you haven't been thinking like God's people. Have you been studying your Hebrew Bible and believing it? No. Well, see, what's Christendom done for 2,000 years? Hmm. <laughs> Same thing. 
Ignorance prevails even now, huh? Repent. You were not prepared, Israel, to receive Messiah Jesus in faith because you weren't thinking properly. No renewed mind. Stop thinking of him as an imposter, as a fraud. Start thinking about him for who he really is. Christ, Messiah, King, the Son of God. Repent. Repent. You didn't do that in Matthew to John. There's another chance now. Well, here it is. Acts 3. Another opportunity. God is merciful. Absolutely. This whole nation deserves wrath. God is withholding it. An extension of mercy for only a year, though. This isn't indefinite. Oh, we can continue in our sin and no repercussions. Oh, foolish. So Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore, you can't take back Calvary. It's done. It's over. You already crucified Messiah. You can't undo it. What you can do is receive Him because He's coming back. Whether or not you receive Him, He's still coming back. Be prepared. Acts 3.19 Acts 3.19 Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you. Be converted. Converted means be turned around. You're going the wrong way. Turn around. If you repent, change your mind, that will cause you to change your direction. You are an untoward generation. Acts 2.40 Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Perverse, crooked. Spiritual scoliosis. Not upright. Not righteous. Corrupt. Sinful. Think differently. Think about God's word to you. Believe it. And then you will turn, changing direction. Untoward, you aren't moving to God, you're moving from Him. You've drifted from Him, still drifting. Repent ye therefore, and be converted. That your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. <sighs> That's a lot. That's a mouthful. Some intricate details here. To analyze. We compare this to Acts 2.38. 
Acts 2.38 and Acts 3.19.20 and 21. They are companion passages. And I've already told you, Acts 2.38 is such a burden for so many. A headache for so many. Because they aren't using it dispensationally. Not God's fault. If we struggle with verses, what does it mean? Well, it means what it says. What's it teaching? It, it's teaching what it says. If you want some insight, some light, why not look for similar verses for help? See, that's, that's, that requires study and work. This isn't a lazy man's time. This is Bible study. We think this isn't mindless religious busyness. We think and we flip. Flip pages. Acts 2.38 Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, how many denominationally minded individuals quote Acts 2.38 constantly? Or, or are they really thinking about what it's saying? Of course not. They wouldn't be saying it. They're just repeating what they've heard in their church or doctrinal statement, denominational system. Acts 2.38, listen to the sequence. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the remission of sins. See, they like the water baptism and the repentance. Oh, yes, but when... A great many people come to that for the remission of sins. Oh no, not, not for. You aren't repenting and being baptized to get forgiveness of sins. You're repenting and being baptized because you are forgiven of sins. Because, uh, uh, uh. retranslating there the Greek word ice or ace, E-I-S, epsilon, iota, sigma. For there, for the remission of sins, does not mean because of. Acts 2.38 is not our gospel message. It's Israel, 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 Israel. Acts 2.38 is Israel. It's Israel's national repentance. It's Israel's national baptism, water baptism. And it's so they can receive forgiveness, remission, forgiveness of sins, and the Holy Spirit, when? And see, this is a national issue. Okay? Acts 3.19. Let me, let me stop a second. Hold on. I heard a preacher one time. Oh, a dear brother in Christ, but as confused as could be. He was instructing some people who had a question about Acts 2.38. Well, none of them had really anything substantive, substantial, meaningful, to say about Acts 2.38. None of them really knew what it was teaching. Clueless. If only they had turned the page to Acts 3.19 for light. And they would have understood Acts 2.38 Mm. 
so close to the truth, and yet so far from it. That's why the body of Christ languishes in such a maturity. What's Acts 2.38 about? I don't know. Oh, look, let me keep flipping there. Acts 3.19. Oh, that'll help, huh? Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord, and he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. When Jesus Christ comes back, what is that? Second coming, right here. He will blot out Israel's, 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 Israel's. Israel's, Israel's sins. This has absolutely nothing to do with us at all. So we don't have to wonder or fret. Why doesn't it say forgiveness now? Why does it say forgiveness later? Because it's Israel, not the body of Christ. Oh, oh. Now the Bible is a blessing, not a burden. Acts 5. Acts 5. We still have a long way to go. We have to finish Acts 3 here. Acts 5, verse 30. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom he slew and hanged on a tree, him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior, for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Hmm, there it is. We go back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord, but this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. The book of Hebrews takes that passage. Read Hebrews 8 and Hebrews 10. Read Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. The blood of Jesus Christ is the basis of the new covenant. The perfect, sinless Son of God shed His blood to pay Israel's sin debt. That's what we learn with the completed Bible canon. I'll show you a few more. Micah. The little book of Micah. Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Micah 7, 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion, mercy, pity on us. And that's Israel. He will subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins 
into the depths of the sea. <laughs> An old preacher long ago, he stated it like this. God will take Israel's sins, the new covenant. He will throw them into the sea and he will put a sign up. No fishing. Hmm. One more passage. Romans 11. Romans 11. Romans 11, 25, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. Oh, there's plenty of that. That blindness in part has happened to Israel forever. No, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. We haven't replaced Israel. We are Israel. God isn't through with Israel. He set them aside for a time, temporarily. The blindness of Israel is only for a time until God is through with us. The dispensation of grace. The mystery program. We'll see that later in Acts 3. Romans 11, 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. That's the new covenant. Paul is quoting Isaiah 59. The last few verses. Read Isaiah 60. There's the kingdom. I will take away Israel's sins when when Jesus Christ comes back see future Romans 5:11 see contrast this with Paul's message to us the church the body of Christ a different dispensation. Romans 5, 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. We're at one with Father God through Jesus Christ. Now. Now. We don't wait until the second coming, but Israel does. See the difference? Now, when you mix all of those verses together, there's only one gospel. Well, my friend, good luck in resolving those conflicting passages. You'll never resolve them unless you rightly divide the word of truth. If you mix them up, don't have a prayer in the world of ever understanding anything in any of those verses. You've destroyed them. You've removed them from their dispensational contexts. The result is confusion, disappointment, discouragement, heresy, apostasy. Ruin. Ruin. Now, 1 John 2. 1 John 2, 1 John 2, verse 12, John is writing to believing Israel here, the little flock, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. So, an individual's sins, here in early Acts, the believer's individual sins are forgiven. But Israel's national sin, national sin debt, 
He is not forgiven until Christ comes back. Okay? This has nothing to do with us. Nothing. If you want to think about this, the blotting out of Israel's sins. In the Old Testament, debts were inscribed on tablets of wax. When the debt was paid, a flat instrument was used to smooth it out. The debt is gone, erased. Just like the ledger, so and so owes me this amount. The debt is paid, the eraser comes, whoosh, cleared, blot it out. If you want, read Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. Every year, Israel's high priest went once a year behind the veil and applied animal's blood on the mercy seat. That's to take care of Israel's sins every year. That looked forward to the second coming, the prophetic day of atonement, when Israel's sins or paid for with the blood, the precious blood of Jesus Christ, and wiped away forever. Remember, a long time ago, I'll put the link in the description, I taught on the feasts of Jehovah, those seven feasts of the Lord, as recorded in Leviticus 23. I briefly went over this in John, when we were in John, reviewing John. Israel's religious calendar, Leviticus 23, and those holy days, those seven feasts, those look forward to major events on Israel's prophetic timeline. Now, they were all future for Moses. From our perspective, four of them are now history, and three are prophecy. This is like an eight hour long study that I'm summarizing here. <laughs> Look in the description for the link. You can watch those videos I produced some years back. The Feast of the Lord, the Feast of Jehovah. First feast, first annual feast, holiday, holy day in the law was Passover. Passover looked to the cross, pointed to the cross. And leavened bread, number two, the burial of Christ. First fruits, the resurrection of Christ. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. See, the first four feasts. Christ will die, Christ will be buried, Christ will be raised again, the Holy Spirit will be poured out. There are three more feasts on the calendar, and these would be in the fall. Those were in the spring, summer. Now it's the fall. Trumpets, Day of Atonement, Tabernacles. Those are future. Trumpets, the regathering of Israel. Read Matthew 24, second coming of Christ. The twelve tribes of Israel regathered into the promised land. The Day of Atonement that matches the blotting out of Israel's sins when Christ comes back. And Tabernacles, 
That's the kingdom. Millennium. So, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, the of atonement, tabernacles. This is God's book. Acts 3, 19. Israel's sins will be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. We have forgiveness in Christ as members of the church, the body of Christ, now. Forgiveness now. Forgiveness of all sins now. Ephesians 1. Ephesians 4. Colossians 1. Colossians 2. Colossians 3. What about 1 John 1 9, Brother Sean? Oh, well, what about it? 1 John 1 9 is for lost Israel who says they don't sin. Hmm. 1 John 1 9 has nothing to do with believers in Israel's program either. Because in 1 John 2.12, next chapter, believers are forgiven. How many times can you be cleansed from all unrighteousness? If we're cleansed of only the sins we confess, then that means God imputes sin to us. Oh, look, see, now that contradicts Romans 4. He won't impute sin to us. If God imputes sin to us, that means we're going to hell. Ugh, well, moving along. Nothing but confusion and denominationalism again. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus Christ which before was preached unto you whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So, verse 19, the times of refreshing, and verse 21, the times of restitution of all things. This term refreshing here, a breathing again, a reviving. The times of refreshing. In case you haven't noticed, my friend, we live in a sin-cursed world. Genesis 3. Genesis 3. After, 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 after Adam and Eve sinned. Listen. God pronounces a curse on this planet. Genesis 3, 16. Unto the woman God said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam God said, because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face, shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. When you find the conception and the birth pangs, and the thorns and the thistles, and the back-breaking work, You just remember Genesis 3, the 
the book of Genesis is literal history. Romans 8. The perfect world that existed in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is gone. Not God's fault. Romans 5. Romans 5 first. Wherefore, 12, as by one man, and that's Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Oh, God is so unfair. He punished us because of what Adam did. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. I'm sorry. A false accusation. Let's keep reading Romans 5. Keep reading Romans 5. Because of Jesus Christ's obedience, we can be made righteous in God's sight. Oh, so if it's unfair for God to punish us because of what Adam did, then it's unfair of God to grant us righteousness because of what Jesus Christ did. See? We don't deserve it. Oh, well, then we don't deserve righteousness either. Ah. Oh. There's a balance, my friend. We're doomed because of Adam. We can be made righteous because of Christ. Read Romans 5. Romans 8. Romans 8, 17. And if children, then, then heirs, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, and is suffering under the curse here, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. Amen. And not only they, but ourselves also, Christians, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit, the redemption of our body. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? If the Lord tarries, these physical bodies will grow sick, grow old, and die. That's the curse of sin. We are waiting for the redemption of our body, this physical body. In order for us to understand God is not reigning today in creation, He allowed a curse. He put a curse on creation. In Genesis 3, so we know good and well, Satan is in charge. This is not what the Creator intended, absolutely not. It's only for a time Satan reigns. It's only for a time sin reigns. Only for a time. Why doesn't God do something about it now? Oh, well, we'll save that for Acts 3 a little later in this study. The point is, creation is in bondage. The bondage of corruption. One day, creation will be liberated.
X3 again. X3. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Isaiah 51, for example. Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51, verse 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden, like the Garden of Eden, and her desert like the Garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. There's kingdom restoration. There's Israel's restoration. There's the land of Canaan's restoration. There's creation's restoration. Try this one, Isaiah 11. Isaiah 11, 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. This is Messiah. This is Christ. This is Jesus Christ in his kingdom. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding and the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor. Read Matthew 4 and Luke 4. Satan reigns in the earth. Adam in Genesis 1 relinquished earth's governments, gave up earth's governments to Satan. So Jesus Christ now, he takes back those governments. Isaiah 11, 4, But with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, baby goat, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. This is all literal, okay? And the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, and the sucking child shall play on the hole of it. the asp, venomous snake, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den, another venomous snake. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Look at that. Ecology. Another part of the curse of sin. You read the close of Genesis 1. People and animals prior to the curse, prior to the fall, ate vegetation only. No carnivorous beasts. No carnivorous people until after the fall. Not anymore. Why is that 11? They're all herbivores again. The curse is reversed because Jesus Christ reigns now. Let's try. Isaiah 9, Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end 
upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The Lord of hosts, Almighty God, is zealous, is passionate. He wants judgment and justice to reign in the earth. Is, is today's society just? Look at our educational systems, religious systems, court systems economic systems, are they just? Are they God-honoring? Huh. That's okay. One day, all of that will be set right. That's the strength of the Christian's position. You know, atheism, uh, highly simplistic. Atheism is nothing more than a profession of there is no justice in the earth and there never will be because there is no God to enforce anything ever. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, if you want to believe that, my friend, have it. Enjoy. The Christian's view is no justice today, but payday someday. All will be made right. Mm -hmm. But it's only when the right man, the God man, gets on the throne. When the system itself is purged. Not just removing people from office, but getting rid of the system entirely. Evil world system. And having a new one. One we're in righteousness. Yes. Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel 36. New covenant. Ezekiel 36. Verse 33. Thus saith the Lord God, In the day that I shall have cleansed you from all your iniquities, New Covenant, I will also cause you to dwell in the cities, and the wastes shall be built, and the desolate land shall be tilled, whereas it lay desolate in the sight of all that passed by. And they shall say, This land that was desolate is become like the Garden of Eden, and the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. Then the heathen that are left round about you shall know that I, the Lord, build the ruined places and plant that that was desolate. I, the Lord, have spoken it and I will do it. Hmm. Isaiah 35. Let's try this one. See, Israel's land is restored. Israel is restored to the land, brought back to the promised land. Isaiah, Isaiah 35, verse 1. The wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord. He's come back. Ezekiel 43. And the excellency of our God. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance. Even God with a recompense, He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. See the physical healing? Then shall the lame man leap as in heart, and the tongue of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out, and streams in the desert. And the parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. And the habitation of dragons where each lay shall be grass with reeds and rushes. And an highway shall be there, and a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those 
The wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast shall go up thereon. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So in this sin-cursed world of disease, in a tumultuous climate, and death, and suffering. It's all because of sin. Chaotic, messed up. It's all reversed because Jesus Christ sits on the throne in the ages to come. See that? How unfortunate it is that we have so many sincere people struggling and striving to save this planet from inevitable doom. Environmentalism, conservationism. This world is headed to Daniel's 70th week. There is such destruction in the ages to come, such hell before Jesus Christ reigns. The Antichrist must come. And when Jesus Christ returns to destroy all of that, well, let's just say this. Many a structures are on fire. The Middle East, with its oil reserves, is in flames. There's the purging. Hmm. Amos 9. We have to move along here. Amos 9. There are plenty of verses like this. Describing the kingdom. Amos 9, the prosperity, the peace. Amos 9. Behold, the days come, 13, saith the Lord, that the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him that soweth seed. And the mountain shall drop sweet wine, and all the hills shall melt, and I will bring again the captivity of my people of Israel. And they shall build the waste cities, and inhabit them, and they shall plant vineyards, and drink the wine thereof. They shall also make gardens, and eat the fruit of them. And I will plant them upon their land. And they shall no more be pulled up out of their land, which I have given them, saith the Lord thy God. Another one comes to mind. Micah. John and Micah Nahum. This way. Micah. This is also Isaiah 2. Micah 4. 1. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. That's where he lives. Jesus Christ is living in Jerusalem. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people. And rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares. And their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up a sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. But they shall sit every man under his 
vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. Hmm. See the prosperity, the peace. When will this planet experience peace? When is there world peace? You know, nations have been convening and summiting for centuries. Uh, have they accomplished world peace with their treaties? No. But when Jesus Christ sits on David's throne, ah, there's world peace. That's guaranteed. Will we have world peace? prior to Christ's return? Well, the Antichrist will bring it. There will be no lasting world peace until Jesus Christ comes back. One more in Ezekiel 34, and then we have to get back to Acts 26. And I will make them in the places round about my hill a blessing and I will cause the shower to come down in his season. There shall be showers of blessing. And this is literal rain. Okay, to make crops grow in the kingdom. And the tree of the field shall yield her fruit. And the earth shall yield her increase. And they shall be safe in their land. And shall know that I am the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke. And delivered them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. And they shall no more be a prey to the heathen. That's Israel. Neither shall the beasts of the land devour them, but they shall dwell safely, and none shall make them afraid. And I will raise up for them a plan of renown, and they shall be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, or my people, saith the Lord God, and ye my flock, the flock of my pasture, or men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. All the curses of the law are reversed. Leviticus 26. The blessings of the new covenant. Acts 3. Acts 3. 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution, a restoration here, a making right, of all things, especially the governments. The cross reference to that regeneration is Matthew 19, verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, see, kingdom, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, the regeneration, the kingdom. That's what Acts 3 is about, the kingdom. 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution, a restoration here, a making right, of all things, especially the governments, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Acts 3, verse 19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you. Jesus Christ will come back. Where is he today? Acts 3, 21. Whom the heaven, he's in heaven. Whom the heaven, he's ascended into the heaven. Father's right hand. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. God has been speaking about a literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom since the time of Adam, since the world began. The kingdom that Jesus Christ 
were found in the earth one day is that which Adam could have had. But Adam sinned, and that kingdom was postponed. Matthew 25, 34. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Luke 1. Luke 1. Luke 1, And his father Zechariah, is John the Baptist's father, was filled with the Holy Ghost and prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people, and hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers, and to remember his holy covenant, the oath which he sware to our father Abraham, Abrahamic covenant, that he would grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And thou, John the Baptist, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, Jesus' is earthly ministry, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. See? Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Zechariah's sermon looks to the time when Israel is restored and his son John the Baptist will have a ministry to lead Israel to repentance. See? And then Jesus Christ will be introduced. John is the forerunner of Christ. Jesus Christ will then preach repentance to Israel. And it's to bring Israel to a place of rising the kingdom glory. So Luke 1 70, Acts 3 21, which God hath spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. That's Peter's ministry. Peter's ministry concerns that which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. Compare Acts 3.21. To Romans 16, 25, we rightly divide them. Romans 16, 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, the mystery, the secret, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Okay, that is Paul's ministry. So listen, think, think about it. That which God has spoken since the world began, that's prophecy, that's Peter's ministry, is not the same as that which God has kept secret since the world began. That's mystery. Okay? Spoken since the world began, prophecy. Kept secret since the world began, mystery. Do you see the difference between Peter and Paul? Paul is not one of the twelve apostles. He's not an extension of the twelve apostles, if we can read. Okay? We must rightly divide prophecy from mystery. Peter from Paul, or we don't have a hope of ever understanding Acts. Okay? The prophetic program and the mystery program are two different issues. The mystery program is God's purpose and plan for heaven, the church, the body of Christ, the kingdom and the heavenly places. See, that's us. Okay? The dispensation of the grace of God, that's us. Paul's ministry. Read Romans through Philemon. The Apostle Paul's ministry. 
Okay, X3, we have to move, have to finish X3. X322, for Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. Peter is quoting Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. You can read all of Deuteronomy 18 if you want. Let's try Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee, this is Moses speaking about Jesus Christ. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, a spokesman, a messenger from the midst of thee, a Jew, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. See, that's the definition of a prophet. And he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. God will put his words in the prophet's mouth. Now, Father God is speaking of Jesus Christ. Acts 3. And it shall come to pass, Deuteronomy 18, 19, that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall speak, presume to speak a word in my name, false prophet, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Arrogantly, thou shalt not be afraid of him. Read, read Deuteronomy 13. Hmm. Here's another eye-opening passage about false prophets. Acts 3, Acts 3. The Jesus Christ I am speaking to you about, Israel, was foretold in the writings of Moses, Deuteronomy 18. You're ignorant of Moses, aren't you? John 5. You didn't believe Moses' writings, and that's why you didn't believe Jesus Christ, who is foretold in Moses' writings. Really didn't believe. In Matthew 17, 5, Mark 9, 7, Luke 9.35, God the Father declared on the Mount of Transfiguration, Hear my Son. Hear Him! I am speaking to you through Him. Don't take this lightly. As Moses told, Acts 3.23, who will not hear that prophet? That person will be destroyed from among the people. The Word, John 1, the Word, the spokesman, Jesus Christ, for Father God, spoke to Israel in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did they listen? No. Well, they'll be destroyed. The fiery wrath. The second coming, you can read Hebrews 10, 2 Thessalonians 1, the baptism with fire, Matthew 3, Luke 3. 
He will make his foes his footstool. Acts 2. Psalm 110. Read Psalm 110. Look at his reign. Hmm. The wrath is on the way. Don't take this preaching lightly. Acts 3.24 Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Unto you first, God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Again, this is a Jewish context. The prophets, Samuel, you are the children of the prophets. Verse 25, this is all Israel, isn't it? No Gentiles, no world here addressed. Samuel was a prophet. A spokesman for God. Why does Peter go back only to Samuel? Acts 3.24, Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel onward, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. Well, Samuel anointed David as king. The Davidic covenant goes to David. First Samuel 13. 1 Samuel 13, we have to move here, running out of time. 1 Samuel 13, 14. But now thy kingdom, Saul, shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Hmm. Saul has a replacement. 1 Samuel 16. Verse 13, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him, that's David, in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now that David is reigning, 2 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7, 12, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, that's David, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. According to all these words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan the prophet speak unto David. That's repeated in 1 Chronicles 17, Psalm 89, Psalm 132. It's also quoted in Hebrews 1. Look at Luke 1. A lot of verses. Luke 1, 31, Mary, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Lord, Acts 1, 6, wilt thou restore again the kingdom to Israel? It's not for you to know the time. But look, Acts 2, Acts chapter 2, verse 29, David 30, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, to David, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne.
David's throne, the restoration of David's throne. Jesus Christ is the heir, the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Jesus Christ will be Israel's king forever. When he comes back. Okay. So Acts 3, 24. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel, Samuel there connected to David, Jesus Christ being David's son, Samuel and those that follow after, as many as have spoken, have likewise foretold of these days. And you go back to verse 18. It's the Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew Bible canon. Our Old Testament. In other words, Acts 3 is prophecy. The prophetic program is still functioning in effect. There is no mystery truth in Acts 3, no mystery truth in Acts 2, no mystery truth in Acts 1. This is still the prophetic program. It's still Israel first. Remember Luke 24? Luke 24, 47. And that repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Peter is preaching repentance in Acts 3, according to Luke 24, following Luke 24. It's Israel, Israel, beginning at Jerusalem. See? As in Acts 2. Acts 3, 25. Ye are the children of the prophets. Okay. Are those Gentiles? No. Still Israel. And of the covenant which God made with our fathers, eh, Israel, saying unto Abraham, and in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. The Abrahamic covenant. The covenant which God made with our fathers. This is all covenant ground. Acts 3 is covenant ground. Romans 9, Romans 9, we're going long, I'm sorry. Romans 9, verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Whose are the fathers? And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, his earthly ministry, who is over all God blessed forever. Amen. This is Israel. See, it's Israel. Israel has the promises. Israel has the covenants. Israel has Christ's earthly ministry. Romans 15, verse 8. Romans 15, 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God. The circumcision? That's Israel. To confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That's Israel's fathers, Israel's patriarchs. Remember Acts 3, 13, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, 11. Wherefore, remember that ye in time past, Gentiles, in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ. His earthly ministry was not to Gentiles. I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Matthew 15, 24. Ephesians 2, 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. See Paul's ministry? Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye Gentiles, see, who sometimes were for all, for made nigh by the blood of Christ. In John 4.22, salvation is of the Jews. Christ's earthly ministry is to Israel, eh? because the order of the covenants is Israel first. Genesis 12. Genesis 12, verse 1. 
Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. In Genesis 22, Genesis 22 here, verse 18. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. Now, in Genesis 26, that covenant is passed to Isaac. And in Genesis 28, that covenant is passed to Jacob. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. See, the covenant of Abraham passing to the next generation. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. In Acts 3, Acts 3, 25, Ye are the children of the prophets and of the covenant which God made with our fathers, saying unto Abraham, And in thy seed shall all the kindreds of the earth be blessed. Did God care about Gentiles in time past? He did. That's why he was to save Israel first, so that the Gentiles could then be blessed in Israel's kingdom. Christ's earthly ministry was to convert Israel. Israel first. There's a Greek woman, a Syrophoenician woman, in Mark 7. Mark 7, you can read. Mark 7, 24 through 30. She's willing to have faith in Jesus, but not Israel. Jesus said to her, Mark 7, 24, Let the children first be filled. For it is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. The children of Israel must be fed first. I'm not sent to you. You're a Gentile. Oh, Lord, I know that. Oh, the Gentile woman knew more about God's purpose and plan for Israel than even Israel did. There's a Gentile ready to receive Messiah. It's not even her Messiah. The children of Israel first must be filled. See? And yet, the Lord Jesus has compassion on her. I'll heal your devil-possessed daughter. It's done. See? Israel doesn't want to be converted. And because of that, the Gentiles can't be saved in Israel's kingdom. Israel isn't converted to Jehovah God. Can she bring anyone else to Jehovah God? No. Well, Peter's argument here in Acts 3 is, Israel, have you forgotten about the Gentiles? Do you remember why God created our nation in the first place? It was to reach the whole world. But you don't want to be the channel of salvation and blessing to the world. You killed your Messiah. And you refuse to believe on him in early acts. You're still in rebellion. Get right. He's coming back. Those covenants are for the benefit of the whole world. They're given to Israel to benefit Gentiles, the nations. Don't be selfish, Israel. Be converted. Be turned to Jesus Christ. So that then you can go bring that Jesus Christ to the world. Acts 3, 26. Unto you first God, having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you in, in turning away every one of you from his iniquities. Did they want? No. I'm the physician. I've not come for the righteous. I've come for the sinners. I'm the great physician. You people aren't well. You're sick. Spiritually sick. The lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's what Jesus said in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What made it all the worse was that's where Israel wanted to be. Didn't want to be right. And again, in the modern English versions of textual note, even a New King James Version, 
God has raised up his servant Jesus up. Verse 13, it's son Jesus. Acts 3.26, son Jesus. The proper word is son. Son, that's his deity. In Acts 4, Psalm 2, son is the issue, not servant. Son, it's the same in Acts 3. Son. Unto you first. See, Israel first. God having raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you and turning away every one of you from his iniquities. That wayward path. See, unto our generation. Did they listen to him in his earthly ministry? No. Well, they need to listen to him now, speaking through his apostles. Okay, two more verses. Two more passages. <laughs> okay. Galatians 2, verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference said it nothing to me. This is Paul writing. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he that wrought effectual in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. According to the apostle Paul, in Galatians 2, verse 7, and it's in our King James Bible. There are two Gospels. Okay? The Gospel of the uncircumcision, committed to me, Paul, and the Gospel of the circumcision, committed to Peter. <laughs> now in the modern English versions, you know, only one Gospel in the Bible, the modern English version translators, including the New King James Version, says the gospel to the uncircumcision and the gospel to the circumcision. Oh, look, see, one gospel. No, 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 see, wrong. In our King James Bible, it's two gospels. One gospel committed to Paul's trust. One gospel committed to Peter's trust. Two gospels, okay? two apostleships, Galatians 2.8. The gospel of the circumcision is committed to Peter. That's what Peter is preaching in Acts 3. Israel is to rise to kingdom glory, Isaiah 60, and then reach the world. Gentiles will be saved through Israel's rise to kingdom glory. That's the gospel of the circumcision. Look at Ephesians 2. The circumcision, the nation Israel. Now, the gospel of the uncircumcision committed to Paul's trust, that's salvation going to the world through Israel's fall. Fall. Romans 11. We'll close with this. Romans 11. A lot to take in, huh? Romans 11. We're growing in the scriptures, if we want. Romans 11, 11, I say then have they stumbled, Israel, that they should fall, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them, them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, Israel, the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify mine office. Through Paul's ministry, salvation goes to the Gentiles. Through Israel's fall, not rise, but fall. Okay, so listen, if you want to think of it like this. Peter's ministry, rise of Israel. Paul's ministry, fall of Israel. Up, down. Peter up, Paul down. Israel rise, Peter. Israel fall, Paul. Both of them have the Gentiles in mind overall. Through Israel's rise, Peter, Gentiles are blessed. Through Israel's fall, Paul, Gentiles are blessed. See? But Peter is Gentiles in the kingdom, earthly kingdom. Paul is Gentiles in the church, the body of Christ. Okay. <laughs> That's enough. Acts 3. I told you Acts 3 would be 
<laughs> more difficult than you thought. Oh, just 26 verses. Yeah, but there's quite a bit of doctrine to take out. That's enough. Father God, thank you for your words. Thank you for Acts 3. Now we move on to Acts 4. In Christ's name, amen.